I invite you to receive these words of scripture as we prepare to look once again at the beauty and the glory and the power of the cross. Beginning in Luke chapter 6. One of these days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent all night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles, Simon, who he named Peter and his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Then he went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. And looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you. And he said and taught them the the Beatitudes. And then going on after finishing the Beatitudes, he said to them, But to you who are listening, I say, Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful. He is kind to the wicked. Be merciful just as your father is merciful. And then in Luke chapter 23. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. You pray with me. God, speak to us. Reveal to us the beauty and the glory and the power of the cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There was an amazing astronomical phenomenon this past week was on Wednesday and Thursday night, and if you missed it, you missed it, because it's not going to be visible again until 2039. Venus, the first star, the star that you see first every evening, the star that you pray, you sing to when you sing starlight, star night, bright, first star I see tonight, Venus, which orbits on the Earth's inner orbit, and Jupiter, which orbits the sun on the Earth's outer orbit, 
So Jupiter goes around the sun once every 12 years, and Venus, because it's on the inside of Earth's orbit, goes around the sun every 0.615 Earth years. So every 222, 25 days, it makes a circuit around the sun, which means I've learned and get ready for your head to hurt, which means that a day on Venus is a little longer than a year on Venus. I don't really understand what that means, but I read it on the NASA website, so I'm thinking it's true. But this past week, the orbits of the Earth, the Moon, Venus, and Jupiter were so particularly aligned that from the Earth, without a telescope, at sunset, you could watch these planets move closer and closer and closer until on Wednesday and Thursday, something happened that astronomers call orbital conjunction, but poets call a planet's kiss. So I've been talking about this, um, and I, I, you could watch it on that night and it was glorious, these two bright objects coming closer and closer together. And for a brief instant, they appeared to connect, even though they were 400 million miles apart from one another. They were so close that the distance between them appeared to be less than half the width of the nail on your pinky when you held it at arm's length. And it was this wonder the glory of creation, these planets moving, dancing all around us. And that moment actually happens quite frequently, but the sunlight blinds us to it. So that moment of beauty is only made visible in the darkness of night. We see this astonishingly beautiful moment, and in it, the heavens are telling the glory of God, and we see this moment, and it is so far away, this beauty that we can perceive from a great distance. Venus is 127 million miles away, and Jupiter is 530 million miles away from us. But from where we stand, you could see that beautiful moment even from all this distance. If you look to the West, you could see it, and it happened last week. And some people didn't see it. Some people saw it and didn't notice. Some people saw it and didn't understand the significance of it. It was just two stars close in the sky. Who cares? But a few who knew what they were seeing beheld it as a moment of glory. Luke tells us that after climbing to a mountaintop and praying all night long, Jesus chooses 12 of his friends as apostles. And the ones he chooses, they're not impressive, and they're not reasonable choices for someone trying to build a spiritual movement. He chose fishermen and tax collectors and zealots, which means freedom-fighting revolutionaries. He chose two men named Judas, one of him he chose, knowing he would betray him. And the next morning, after that moment, Jesus led the chosen ones back down the mountain to the plains, down to where everyone was waiting for him. There was a crowd of people who had sought him out, people who had been following him, some of whom were not following him for spiritual enlightenment. They were following him because they needed relief because they were suffering, because they were dying of diseases, because they were possessed by spirits that would not give them a moment's peace for all kinds of different reasons. People were there in the crowd waiting for Jesus because they knew there was power in him, healing power. And so they reached out to touch him. And he began to teach them, teach them all, not just the apostles who had been chosen on top of the mountain, but all who came to him seeking relief. He began to teach them about his kingdom, which is God's realm of shalom. And first he taught the Beatitudes, how blessing 
falls. A declaration of what re of reality, of what is, in spite of what seems to be to us. And then after he gave them that revelation of blessing, he began to teach and instruct all who were reaching out to him, all who wanted to be touched by his power. He began to teach them how to live in his power. And the first thing he says is love your enemies. He doesn't start off with, now I want you to pray like this. I need you to go worship over here at this time and this frequency. He doesn't start out by saying, for God's sake, whatever else you do, don't let women preach and don't let men get married to each other. He skips all the Christian culture war issues that we are so obsessed with. And he says to them, I tell you who hear me. Eugene Peterson's message translation is, he says, I tell, I speak to you who are ready for the truth. Love your enemies. We're over here arguing about how old the earth is according to scripture, rebuilding the ark so that people will somehow see God and pay attention to the Bible, arguing about do we believe that Jonah was literally swallowed by a fish or not? Do you believe in the parting of the Red Sea? Do you take the Bible literally? How about this? Do you believe Jesus when he says, love your enemies? Do you shout amen when he commands, do good to those who hate you? Do you ponder it in your heart when he says, bless those who curse you? Do you say, yes, Lord, when you hear him say, pray for those who mistreat you? Is he still your Lord and Savior when he says, if you love those who love you, who cares? Even sinners do that. And if you are committed to doing good for people who do good to you, who cares? Everybody does that. But if you love your enemies and do good to them without expecting to get anything back, then your reward will be great. Then you will be sons and daughters of the Most High because God is kind to the ungrateful. God is kind to the wicked. So Jesus says, be merciful, be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. That's the sermon that he preached. And then the son of God set his face toward Jerusalem and he walked towards the ones who hated him, his enemies who were plotting against him. And he gave himself over into their power and they falsely accused him and they perverted justice to try him. And though three times Pontius Pilate declared him to be innocent, he was condemned as guilty and sentenced to death because then and now the justice system of the empire does not exist to dispense justice for the weak and the innocent, but to preserve order for the guilty and the strong. And when he was condemned, they beat him and tortured him and walked him up to Golgotha, the place called the Skull, and they crucified him between two other criminals, one on his right and one on his left, the very places of honor his apostles had been fighting over hours earlier. And Jesus, who preached, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you, Jesus opened his mouth and prayed a blessing on his killers. He prayed for them. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, this isn't a passage that we argue about taking literally. Scholars, yes, but real people, we don't have any trouble believing that Jesus said this. We agree that it literally happened, but we just don't take it seriously. Well, yeah, Jesus did that, but that doesn't have anything to do with me. <laughs> I mean, the cross means that Jesus will always forgive me because I haven't crucified him or anybody else, but it's got nothing to do with the way I hold my enemies in my heart. Let's not sugarcoat it. This is dangerous theology. It's holy, it's true, but it's dangerous. And it has been twisted and weaponized 
to become an accusation against victims, why don't you just forgive? Why don't you just get over it? It's been blasphemed to excuse the guilty. Well, they didn't know, so they're innocent. To absolve victimizers, they didn't understand, so they're not culpable. So let's get something straight if we're going to talk about this. Jesus is not here declaring that his enemies are innocent. In his prayer, Jesus is declaring that they are guilty. He prays and asks the Father to forgive them because they need forgiveness, because their actions condemn them to the pit of hell. Jesus' prayer does not absolve his enemies of their guilt. Jesus' prayer presumes their guilt. If you're innocent, you don't need forgiveness. But Jesus' enemies are guilty, and they do. They were blinded by their fear. They were possessed by their hatred. And so they exchanged truth for lie, and they perpetrated great evil all the while believing or pretending to believe that they were righteous. But the truth is, they did not know what they were doing because they did not know truth. Blind and possessed, they were captive to sin, and Jesus, with his last breath, set them free. Their hatred and their worship of evil condemned him to death, but his love saw their need for forgiveness, and as he was dying, he set them free and became their way and our way to everlasting life. And so many people were surrounding him, so many people were so close to him, but so few could see the truth that on that day, the one imprisoned was the only one truly free. Hate, pain, suffering, and death had no power to deter his will. He was free, and he chose his way over evil with his last breath, which we know was not his last breath after all. But what you need to see is that you don't have to wait till Easter to see God's glory. You don't have to wait to see the empty tomb to see the triumph. You have to learn to see it on the cross, here in this moment, when Jesus loved his enemies, he blessed them, he prayed for their forgiveness, and he secured mercy for them. And in this moment, for us, we see what force of reality is ultimately powerful Because all that came against Jesus could not overcome him. And with those words, love and mercy prevailed. And understand this, church. Jesus could pray for their forgiveness. Only Jesus could pray for their forgiveness because he was their victim. They were his enemies They thought that he was in their power, but truly and eternally, once they condemned him and tortured him and tried him and deserted him and betrayed him and taunted him and nailed him to the cross, they were in his power. And only the victim has the power to forgive. You cannot forgive someone for a wrong they have done to someone else. You can sympathize. You can empathize, you can console, you can comfort, but you cannot forgive. I can't forgive Jim for stealing John's money. Only John can do that or refuse to do that. Only one person had the power to forgive that day, and it was Jesus, and he used it. He used his power to love his enemies to overcome the evil that was against him with his goodness, to bless and do good without any expectation of return. He used his power to unleash mercy, not vengeance, and his mercy unleashed grace. And that's what we have to see on the cross, not the power to kill but the power to forgive, not the power to do violence, but the greater power to show mercy. It wasn't the violence that was perpetrated that unleashed salvation. It was the forgiveness that Jesus offered. 
That's why we look at the cross and gasp in awe and wonder because we see the beauty and power of it across space and time. We see this indescribably beautiful thing, this moment when people murdered the Son of God and the Son loved his own so much that even though they did not receive them, he loved them steadfastly all the way to the end and prayed for their forgiveness and glorified God. On the cross, you have to see the battle, church, between good and evil, between love and hate, between faith and fear, between forgiveness and vengeance, and you have to see God's choice. And then seeing the cross, you have to make your own the risk, the cost of choosing forgiveness, it is real. It is incalculable. It is dangerous. And that's why many people, even people who love Jesus, refuse. Because they believe that forgiveness will only embolden and empower evil. They believe there must be punishment as a deterrent. They believe blood requires blood. It's the way of the world. It's what we all know and it's what we understand. So we hate those who hate us and we despise those who despise us and we have contempt for people who are contemptible and we say there are some who are not worthy of grace. They're not worthy of love. They're not worthy of forgiveness and thinking this way is only natural. We say there have got to be limits. But when we do that, with our hearts, we're declaring that to us, the greatest power in the world is the power to destroy. On the cross, we have to see Jesus destroying the power of destruction. On the cross, we see the only way of overcoming. On the cross, we see the moment when the orbit of hate and the orbit of love conjoin good and evil cross paths. And in that moment, there wasn't destruction. There wasn't a fiery implosion of righteousness. In that awful moment, in that awe-filled moment, what we see is the Holy One reclaiming his own with a sacred kiss of mercy. That is the saving way of Jesus, the only way of destroying sin and evil. And we can choose the Jesus way for ourselves or not. But what we cannot do is deny that the one we call Lord, the one whose death we say saved us, that one died forgiving and praying for his enemies. At the beginning of his ministry, he stood on a plane and said to the crowd, all of us, if you're ready for the truth, if you seek my power, then hear this, love your enemies. 